The writing appears to be on the wall that the Federal Reserve in the United States is going to impose some quantitative easing on the economy this week. And uh, obviously this is a critical decision they have to make. For some context on this, we are joined by Christopher Sands. He is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. He joins us from Washington. It's good to see you, Christopher. Uh, first of all, do you expect any movement on interest rates or is there how much pressure is there to move on interest rates for the Fed? Decision coming more or less contemporaneous with an election, which seems to be suggesting a big, a big change, but perhaps gridlock, so no change in the direction of the U.S. fiscal uh, overeating. There's going to be a lot of inflationary pressure in this economy, and if we don't get growth, it could be stagflationary. Uh, this would be a good time to start exercising some discipline rather than easing, but everyone's betting on that easing. You're seeing the dollar fall against the euro, against, uh, against the yen, even against the Canadian dollar, and I think that that's a sign that the markets don't like the direction that the Fed is going. So what do you expect them to actually say at the end of this meeting? Well, I, the ideal thing would be to leave rates unchanged. I think that would be not bowing to political pressure, but at the same time postponing the tightening decision, which probably has to come before the end of the year. Uh, at the same time, if, uh, if there is a feeling that this may be their, their last chance to ease one more little push, uh, they may decide that they're going to let interest rates go down further. There's just very little room for them to go down at this point. Uh, they've used this trick a few times too many. So what I'd hope they would do, and I guess I'm giving you all three answers here, is I hope that they'll start raising the interest rates, sending the signal that we're going to tighten up in this economy moving forward. How much of an effect is the uh, election? First of all, what do you expect to come out of the election? Are the Democrats going to have their head handed to them? And, uh, and what effect will this have? Well, it looks clear that they're going to lose the House of Representatives, and that uh, uh, that's the chamber that tends to swing the most, and so all the polls seem to suggest Republican gains enough to take control of the chamber, uh, and that I think is significant. It'll mean that money bills, including the budget, will come out of that uh, new caucus of, of largely uh, Republican members. It'd be interesting, too, because a lot of them are new faces for us. When the Democrats took over in 2006, it was in some ways a restoration. A lot of the old faces that had been around in 1994 were getting a second chance at the gavel. We knew who they were. We knew where they were going to go. We're seeing a new crop of Republicans come in, relatively younger. Some of them are, are military veterans. All of them seem to have got the Tea Party bug and are coming in with a view to fiscal discipline discipline that we haven't seen in Congress in quite a while. So I think that'll set a pace. Remember that the current Congress, the one that's being voted uh, on now, the, the incumbents, didn't even pass a budget this year. Sort of an unprecedented dereliction of duty from the Congress. Uh, so I think a change in the House could make a big difference. On the Senate side, the bets are all over the place. It looks like the Democrats will either retain control or, if the Republicans gain enough to get the majority, they still aren't going to get enough to override filibusters, and so that chamber will continue to be a, a sort of blocking mechanism, slowing down the pace of, uh, of big change, while at the same time not able to discipline the earmarks and uh, all of the extra spending. I, I think that puts us on a course for, for a real clash between the House and the Senate as we move into the next Congress. You know, in Canada, of course, we have a lot of political parties. We've got the mainstays, of course, all the way down to the Marxist-Leninists and the Green. Give us more on the Tea Party here. This faction, it is strictly a faction of the Republicans, right? Well, there are some Democrats who've moved over, and the key for them has been a lot of independence. We've seen party identification dropping in the United States in the last couple of decades. Uh, there was a time when most Americans would tell you they were Republican or Democrat, even if they said that with some remorse. They at least had a party affiliation. We've seen uh, independents go from, say, 30 percent to 40 percent. Some even estimate 50 percent of the electorate when polled. And the independents have swung in the direction of the Tea Parties. In a lot of ways, I think the way to look at the Tea Party is as a baby boomer movement. Remember, the baby boomers came in and their baptism by politics was the peace movement. Like the Tea Parties, not very many leaders, uh, just sort of a a cause that drew people into the streets and got them excited. Well, some of the people who are leading the Tea Party used to be peace movement kids some time ago, but now they've, they've changed. They're worried about fiscal discipline and they're taking to the streets. It's uh, supported Republicans, at least insofar as they're the opposition today. But if Republicans don't deliver fiscal discipline, you may see the Tea Party move uh, turn on them 
uh, and go back to the Democrats, just anybody who's willing to start cutting America's fiscal spending. I get it. All right. Thank you for giving us some uh, perspective there and helping us understand a very complex situation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Our guest has been Christopher Sands. He is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, and he spoke to us from Washington, D.C.